The, uh, the lights got brighter, so I think that's my cue to start. Um, thanks for getting caffeinated and coming to see this, guys. I know it's the end of the day, but it's going to be fun. So this is a talk about a state machine-based data store that we have in production right now. So my name is Richard Crowley. I work for a company called Bettable, and I've done all manner of operations and engineering development work for a number of years. And uh, I'm certainly fascinated by the, the lower level stuff more so than the higher level. So this storage thing is right up my alley. I work for a company called Bettable. It's gambling as a service. Seriously, we make REST APIs that developers that are unlicensed can use to build legal gambling games in all the jurisdictions that we're licensed in. And we handle all the money and the math. They handle all the, the game parts, the fun parts. and. Uh, and don't have to worry about any of the legal stuff. So we began our uh, quest to take over the gambling industry, uh, which is easy in some sense because there's not really been any innovation there in 100 years, and they're, they're really working with some 90s technology. We began by tackling what we were calling the games of chance. These were single player games that were resolved in single events, things like slot machines, things like um, well, like just a, a weighted list of outcomes and picking one randomly. Um, and all these games were played against the house, and that's the important part. Bettable is the house in this, in this world that we live in. And these games that were single player that we, we modeled as single events made it really easy to build REST APIs. So literally there's an API where a, a game can on your behalf send us a request that says, did I win? And we say, nope. And sometimes we say, yep, of course. You know, we do let people win sometimes. Um, but, but that isn't enough. The goal for us is to build all the primitives and all the, the little pieces such that a developer can express any game that they can dream up for real money on Bettable's platform. And so there's a lot more that we're going to have to build beyond this single event games of chance nonsense. Uh, and the first one that we decided to tackle based on a lot of requests from people that are using the platform is roulette. And not just any roulette, because we have roulette that's a single event where you're playing just by yourself and it's boring, they wanted the multiplayer variety where we can all sit at one big roulette table and all bet on the same number coming up. And, uh, and that's still a single event, sort of, right? There's only one random outcome in that. And that, that makes it sort of similar. But then there's all these multiple players. And players are deadbeats, so sometimes they don't act very quickly and they, they mess around and, and forget to bet. And so, there's this time dimension where we have to take into account that everybody's doing a little bit different things at a little bit different times. And this time dimension where we have to open up betting and then collect bets for a little while and then resolve the outcome means that it doesn't fit very well into REST. At best, we could build sort of one of those, like, are we there yet polling kind of APIs. And people have been trying to get out of that for years on the internet. So we're not going to go down that road. This being the first of, of many of these sorts of games that, that have more complicated mechanics and more interactive multi-event sort of things. Uh, we wanted to, to get at what the primitives were in, in what we needed to build in this system. And there's a couple of key observations. The first is that most of the events in the system were asynchronous from the player's perspective. And these are events like, from my perspective, you betting is some asynchronous event that comes in from the outside, or the round resolving at some time in the future, and, and I find out that it was red, but I bet black. That happens asynchronous to whatever that I do. It's not a request response cycle anymore. But on the server, for, from Bettable's perspective, all of these events happen in a very narrow time slice. It's a high concurrency environment where all of us go place bets all at the same time, and then a second later or, or a couple of seconds later, that final outcome is resolved and everybody gets paid out. Again, all at one time. And that's a, a couple of unique constraints. Whoops, too far. And so we were started to distill this down to requirements. And, and the, the big ones were that we needed some notion of player presence, which we didn't have before. When you're making REST calls, it actually doesn't matter what you do in between or whether your phone is on the network. But now we need to know, because we need to know if you've left the table, then you don't get sent events about that guy winning anymore. If you're still at the table, then we need to alert you when betting opens and when betting closes and what the outcome was and whether you won. And so there's, 
there's these server sent events that are both broadcasts, like the round is over and the result was seven. And there's also messages specifically like, your bet was unacceptable because you ran out of money or you won 100 pounds. And there's also these timeout conditions where after 10 seconds, the round closes, no more bets are allowed, and we have to communicate all of these things out to the players. So we started by thinking, OK, let's open a socket. And then one of our engineers named Nate Brown took a step back and actually evaluated the problem and thought about the clients that were going to be building these games, the developers that were going to be building them, and made a pretty compelling case to build from the WebSocket standard. Number one, it was actually kind of becoming a standard and not a loose collection of we should have this in a browser, Rabble Rousers. And you know the security design flaws had been worked out. It's starting to see really wide support in browsers, which is huge. The thing that pushed it over the top is there are also really good libraries in iPhone and Android land to be able to do WebSockets programmatically from within native code. And that meant that we could build this one thing rather than having to bolt on something else to do this stuff in a browser later. So WebSockets it is. I've been trying to get Nate to give a talk about the WebSocket stuff because building the, the queuing and all the, the stuff that has to go along with it to do reliable delivery and, and all the right semantics and deal with these broadcasts and, and messages and things is interesting in its own right. So what we ended up with, we're starting to see some architecture form. There's this WebSocket layer up front and from the outside, you make a WebSocket connection in and we terminate that and inside it's all rest. And so that means our internal architectures didn't have to change. On the way back out, that WebSocket layer is itself a rest service and translates back into a WebSocket message to get back to the player. And then underneath all these middle, middle tier services, there's the storage system. And that's what I'm here to talk about today because that's one of the other cool ends to this system. So at the beginning, at the outset of this project, we were a, a shop that was all Cassandra all the time. And, and it was good to us, actually. Cassandra um, operationally has been a breeze. It does what it says on the tin. We don't ask a whole lot of it, so we don't use the, uh, the counter features. We don't use secondary indexes heavily. Um, we don't use extremely wide rows. We use it as a distributed key value store, and it works remarkably, remarkably well for that. And has the bonus of if someday we should need to fix it, it's Java and not Erlang. So that's cool. So we tried to use Cassandra first. It, it was, you know, we wanted to be good to the thing that had been good to us, so we tried. So here's what we tried. With these requirements of needing to enforce at the system level some very high level domain specific constraints, not, not something like a foreign key relationship or, or something like that, but some, some meatier things and some things that are dependent on the rules of a game. We needed serializable updates and we needed an audit trail because we're already so far off the rails of what a typical gambling operator does that the utmost certainty and guarantees and proof that what we're doing is all totally legit, that we've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's, all that's very important to us. And given that we have this idea of all of us in this room playing roulette at the same time, we have to think about high concurrency updates. So we came up with a, a bit of a straw man use case for this system. And despite the fact that the first client was gonna be roulette, we were actually thinking about bingo. So suppose we wanted to sell a thousand bingo cards instantly, some, for some value of instantly, right? But we had these constraints on it. Well, first of all, we couldn't sell one to people that didn't have money. That's a separate system. We couldn't sell more than a thousand cards because those are the rules of the game. That's, that's the, what sets the odds of the game. We can't sell more than four to any particular player because, again, that, that's a rule that we're enforcing that is helping to determine the odds of the game. So that's something we have to communicate to players. And then as we progress through the, the, from the buying period to the game period, the moment that first ball is drawn, we can't sell any more cards, and that has to be a hard and fast rule. There's no, there's no overlap for network round trips or anything like that. <clears throat> so we did some back of the envelope math and figured that conservatively we're talking about a few hundred kilobytes of data, and we're mutating bits of that data a thousand times in a very short period of time. And all these cards have to be sort of dealt with in one big chunk because of the dependence on making sure we don't sell more than a thousand and making sure no more than four are owned by the same player. And, uh, and so 
we started to get a, a handle on the size of the project, and so we started to build a couple of prototypes. So the first thing was an experiment in seeing if we, how far down into Cassandra we could push the concurrency control. This was a, a very abstract experiment and, uh, and didn't make it into the building it into the real system, but we got to a point where we had a doubly linked list that we could append atomically to in Cassandra, and it was done with sort of an optimistic concurrency control. And, uh, and so here's how that worked. There were two column families, and in Cassandra there's an interesting thing where the columns in a column family, which is kind of a table, are sorted by their names. So we could build a column family sorted by longs and use timestamps as those keys. So the algorithm went like this. We would put our new list tail into the entries column family, and it would be pointing to the old tail. So that's you know, the first half of a doubly linked list append. And then we'd go to the pointers column family, and we'd write our pointer from the previous tail to the new tail. But we'd write it with a timestamp in its column name, and then we could go back and check essentially whether ours won the race, whether we ended up as the first column in that row, and if we didn't, then we know that someone else had won the race for that append and we could go back and do it again. And that's a total death by round trip spiral and you can probably see that if the best we could get to was an optimistic concurrency primitive, it's not going to work well updating a thousand times in a very short period of time. So we stepped back again and, and still wanted to use Cassandra. And so we went the pessimistic locking route and we built a service that was doing the consistent hashing itself so that we could lock around the update of an entity. So we could read something from Cassandra, modify it in this service that is the sort of coordinator for that thing and then write it back to Cassandra. And this worked, but then we're still dealing with the network round trips to Cassandra and we're locking around it. So we have, we have our serializability constraint but we're serializing big network chunks, and that's not gonna work really well. And so at that point, we were starting to think, well, why even bother with Cassandra? What's, what's it actually getting us in that world? <clears throat> and I think the next logical step is, well, let's keep that, but replace the Cassandra part, and we replace it with a relational database and did the thought exercise of how we would build this stuff, and within a relational database, you can do interesting transactional stuff because it's a single node, but the types of constraints that we felt the need to enforce, we thought we couldn't do effectively in SQL, more that it was a pain than that it was impossible, that it was an inelegant API that we would expose to ourselves internally for building what we expect to be a ton of these game mechanics. And since we were essentially using MySQL like a file system in this case, we were locking around stuff, we, were, we could build it out in the same way that we built that second Cassandra system, we were also affected by this death by round trip problem because we're just using a file system but we're using it over a network. So back to these design goals, which play, play no part into which particular technologies we use. We have some high-level constraints that we want to enforce on data, and they're not known ahead of time because they're dependent on the particular game that's being implemented. We want to be efficient in terms of network I.O. because what we measured is that we could only do order 100 or order 50 things per second while enforcing all these constraints, and that just wasn't efficient. We want to be distributed and scale out horizontally. We want to be able to accommodate growing traffic, and, uh, and then we had this this use case that we've been throwing around, this selling a thousand cards instantly and being able to manage all of our constraints at the same time. So this is the moment of truth where we had to step back and decide whether we were really going to build it. And the emphasis in this discussion was on the lack of expressiveness in the storage engines we thought were really realistically available to us relative to a programming language. <clears throat> And we, we balance this discussion by the fact that, frankly, we're very small. Um, it's odd to be speaking at Surge about this because a gambling operator, just economically, I think is a lot smaller than a big consumer website anyway, and we're a new gambling operator. So the small scale gave us this, this question of, well, you ain't gonna need it is the traditional uh, advice on this, that 
you start small by doing the dumbest thing possible. On the other hand, if we ended up with a permanently inelegant, inflexible solution in production because we shied away from this problem, then we would just permanently have this problem. So we built it, and here I am. <clears throat> so here's, um, I'm gonna go through the, the high-level design of the system and dip at bits and pieces into parts of the implementation, um, and then there's a little bit of a war story thing towards the end. So the, a lot of this design is about terminology and about how we laid out the data structures in the system. Um, I just remember a thing I read written by Rob Pike that talks about if you get the data structures right, the rest of a program tends to kind of fall out on the floor. And I, I definitely see that happen. So here we go with some data structures. So an entity, I've used the word a couple times and we need to define it. It's a piece of data with an arbitrary size and an arbitrary but predefined structure. So there is schema in this system. It's not just a, a document store. There is particular schema and it's enforced by a statically typed programming language. These entities are special in that they are the unit of atomicity in the system. So when you store something, you can make guarantees that you'll never observe a partial right to an entity. You'll never observe something midway through. And that's sort of part and parcel with it being the place where we get that serializability that we're after. It's also, this entity is also the unit of distribution around the system. So, so the data store is routing entities to various nodes to balance everything out. And that's transparent to the user that's using the system. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, a roulette table is an entity. That's a, th a thing with an identifier with the list of players that are at the table with some configuration data about the game. There's a roulette round. That's the list of players actually participating, the bets in play, the number that was spun eventually uh, when that update happens. But interestingly, and, and very importantly, a roulette bet is not an entity in the system. And that's for very good reason. The constraints that we have to enforce on a roulette game, like don't let someone bet after the number has been drawn, enforce certain maximum table stakes and maximum bets per user. All the, the structure around what actually is a bet is enforced at the round level, which is what has a state of open for betting and then closed for betting and then totally resolved and paid out. So that's where those things are stored because that's where we have the opportunity to make the decision of if this bet is allowed, for instance. <clears throat> so an entity looks like this. It's, it's Go source code. Nothing magical here. Um, yeah, it's Go, it's trendy, uh, it's fine. The structure is arbitrarily deep, uh, however you want it to be. Uh, the requirement is that it be serializable by Go's encoding packages, and that's not actually a very high bar to set. <clears throat> so the other big thing in this system, and this is where I think we're unique and deviate pretty substantially from the systems that you would be familiar with, is the notion of transitions. So this is the mechanism for all reads and writes of any sort in this system. There's no SQL or, or Thrift API or whatever other people do. To do anything, you make a state transition. This is analogous to a stored procedure, I guess, in a, in a relational database. Um, and a, a, a transition applies to a particular entity, and it acts on that entity. And so there are transitions like creating a roulette table, which, you know, there's empty, an empty set of chairs and all that sort of stuff. You create a roulette round, so then that, that's how you open betting for people to bet on. Then you can create bets, which is a, a transition that applies to the round and adds a bet to the list if it's appropriate. Uh, and then you resolve a round. That's a transition that's submitted by the system, not by a client. And so the transition looks a little bit like this. This too is Go source code. Is it legible? Yeah, looks good. Um, it's, a, it's a Go structure just like an entity is because it's something that we serialize. It's something clients submit to us and we unpack. It's something that we log by serializing. And it has these two methods, prepare and apply. So the prepare method can do a lot of stuff. Um, it can dispatch other transitions into the system. It can generate data, so like building identifiers. It can mutate the transition, so maybe it generates an identifier and then it puts it in the transition. 
Um, and it can load entities. It can do a lot of stuff, but it can't store data. You can't mutate anything in the prepare step. <clears throat> so dispatching deserves a little more detail uh, because this is a, a sort of hack in a way to build cross-entity operations. It's not a transaction in the sense that if you go and do something over there and fail, then, then you've necessarily failed here or vice versa, that if this transition fails, the dispatched ones are rolled back. It's an optimistic thing, and more than anything, it's an efficiency for our developers and for our networks to move transitions around. So we can do something like when we create a table, we create a round for it to have something when it begins. Um, and, and so that, that, uh, that actually has a war story associated with it later. So then there's the apply step. After we've prepared, after we've done whatever mutation, uh, we apply, and the apply at the system level begins by writing to a write-ahead log durably. The transaction, or sorry, the transition is persisted as uh, both this is uh, the basis for our audit trail and also some other stuff. Then that apply method is called, and it's able to enforce whatever domain-specific constraints happen to be in effect for that transition. It has the ability to load entities, to lock them, to store them, to, if it's a read, actually, to just return whatever it wants to. And uh, you can imagine that having to implement something like read roulette table would be totally tedious and boring and, and crap and no one would like it. And you'd be right. So we have some notion of generic transitions in the system where you can submit get entity and it has a type and a key and it returns whatever entity of whatever type and that's that. So we have these, we have that for get index. We could go a little bit further and have update entity that would take a field name and a new value and change it and we could build compare and swap and all sorts of primitives. But what we've found is that by and large, there's always some constraint that's a little bit too domain specific to build generics out of it. So all of our mutations, all of our writes are custom built transitions that the developer of the, the system that's using that transition builds in. So there's, there's a checklist here, I guess, of, of the typical ACID properties and I wanted to go through the, the guarantees that we try to make. So, as far as acid atomicity is concerned, an entity write is atomic, and you can relax that slightly if you want to for, uh, for questionable performance reasons. Um, and that's all I really want to say about that. You can be clever if you want to. We don't make a lot of acid consistency guarantees, and that's simply because this is turn complete, do whatever you want code that's making these updates, we can't really say a whole lot about what's going to happen when you apply a transition other than we know it's not going to crash the database or corrupt the file system or anything like that. But the in, from the entity itself, it's obviously possible for a transition to just write empty garbage data into it and we'd have no idea. Uh, we do support totally normal acid isolation within an entity so you can enforce that no one else can see this entity while I'm manipulating it until I'm done. And we enforce a, a level of durability by syncing the write-ahead log to disk every time that we write it. Uh, now for the more dubious one, CAP, since we do want this to be a distributed system, uh, we favor consistency for a number of reasons, but there are no stale reads in this system, period and that comes at the cost of availability. So this one I, I want to hand wave a little bit about. The strict definition from, from Brewer is that requests to a non-failing node succeed. And that is true. If you send a request to a non-failing coordinator, it will succeed. But entities that are coordinated by some node that is down will fail. To, they, they're just unavailable. And so that's a, a certainly a dissatisfying part of the system right now but not one that's intractable to fix. And in terms of partition tolerance, it's sort of the same story, that if you can get to the coordinator of the entity you're after, you're good to go. So we do make some non-guarantees, and, uh, and specifically, recall with the dispatched transitions that they're not transactional, and so we do not make any guarantees at all about the atomicity of entity spanning operations. If you want to do something on two entities, we don't know where they are based on this second non-guarantee, 
because the system may have stored them on two totally separate nodes, totally separate places, and that's totally allowed. Um, these are, these sort of, these ideas kind of came out of our design process and, and seeing what worked and then uh, were supported by this Life Beyond Distributed Transactions paper, which I definitely recommend. It uh, sort of reads like our design doc, but a lot more formal. <clears throat> So another bit of terminology that, uh, that I've used a couple times that deserves a definition. A, tra a, a transition has a coordinator, and it's up to that, transi that transition how that coordinator is determined. So every transition declares its distribution key, and that's something that goes into the consistent hash function and out pops the address of some process that is the coordinator for that thing. And conventionally, that distribution key is the identifier for an entity. So that's how we arrive at entities being coordinated by different processes. And that's pretty much it. That part is actually totally unsurprising. Uh, and I think I cribbed the code from like some PHP library. Sorry. Um, now what falls out of having coordinators is, is this ring. So there's this notion of a, a set of peers. And these peers are declared on the command line. We don't have a complicated uh, gossip protocol or any sort of uh, network auto discovery thing like elastic search craziness. We just have command line flags and Puppet knows about every node in our infrastructure and knows how to tell everybody about everybody else. So you declare your peers, that's the list of things that are on the consistent hash ring that you're able to route traffic to and receive traffic from. And you declare also the, the list of masters, the list of processes that you want to replicate from. And so there can be multiple. This is not a strict master-slave system. There can be multiple masters. And that gives us the ability to have sort of a flexible replication topology where we could build master-slave, we could build master-master, we can also build the sort of replicate from the next three guys around the consistent hash ring. And what we actually run in production, this is a three-node cluster, so we run everybody replicates everything and everybody has all of the data. And it's great. <clears throat> The other thing that falls out of this notion of having a set of peers that are co communicating with each other is that we have a great degree of network transparency, that this looks like one system and you're none the wiser within these, these constraints about where the atomicity and all that lies. Um, and we implemented it as one listener on every process. So there's no sort of back channel to deal with which makes firewalls nice and all that sort of thing. Uh, the clients can connect to any process. That process will send you to the right place if you send a transition coordinated by someone else. And as an optimization, of course, and, and actually in the extreme bizarre network partition case, it would be a, an availability bump. The client could implement the consistent hash ring and always send things to the right node. We don't do that yet because uh, I, I love latency. <laughs> So the replication subsystem in this um, is certainly a contentious thing internally, so I'll share a little bit with you guys too. It is asynchronous, uh, and that's okay with us to a degree because we're not as worried about Amazon removing our instances from underneath us as Amazon users might be. Um, it's loosely inspired by MySQL's protocol with some simplifications and uh, one, I think, improvement <clears throat> and the important thing is that rather than using the replication subsystem of some other data store, we built this ourselves so that we could replicate the transitions themselves, which are tiny, not the entities themselves, which could be huge. We have no way of knowing. And so the, the key to making this a consistent replication in, in terms of not screwing up data in the ACID sense is that that prepare function that can do mutations and generative things is not called by replication. That's a totally upfront thing. And after that, the transition is set and apply is a deterministic thing. So the process is like this. The slave sends a begin replication transition. Again, everything is a transition. And the payload there is an index and an offset. That's analogous to the relay log in MySQL. That's a file number and an offset in terms of bytes into that file. And then from that request, the master begins streaming data to the slave as it becomes available. As the slave receives this stuff, it logs the transition just like normal. It's going through the normal apply process for that transition. And it additionally logs the cursor 
that came along with that transition. And this is what I think is an improvement over MySQL because there's a, a, an opportunity for a crash to make you lose your position in the relay log. So we log the cursor along with the transition <clears throat> and that, that cursor has the address of the master that sent it, the index and the offset, the, the latest place in the log where we should begin again if we need to. So that means that when we rotate our log to kind of complete the, the square on this, when we rotate the log, we copy all of the cursors, the most recent cursor from the previous log into the new log, such that when we recover, when we begin again, when the process restarts, whatever the case may be, Recovery requires, at most, reading the most recent log file and accepting the cursor that was the last one in that log file. Then we have something that we can call begin replication again and start the whole process up once more. That's all that. <laughs> um, as long as it's not a fire alarm, we're good. <laughs> so then there's, um, for a complete change of subject, secondary indexes. Um, we support a relatively embarrassing and minimal secondary indexing system, and it's declared like this. So this syntax that I've added to the end of the declaration here uh, are tags. In Go, you can specify a tag, which is just a string, on any struct, struct field. And despite the fact that it's a string, it actually has structure to it, and the reflect package reads that structure out. And so this top line here with the dash declares the primary key for an entity, and that could be anything you want. It doesn't have to be the distribution key, but we find that it usually is. And then you could declare some other name as that's the name of an index. So I'm declaring an index called game ID table ID here. And when you declare this stuff, behind the scenes an index is built, which is essentially a map of secondary key values, like a particular game ID, to a list of primary key values, which would just be a bunch of IDs that share that same game ID. And this is implemented behind the scenes by when, uh, when an apply method calls store or store exclusive, more about that in a moment, the index is built up in the background and then the index is made consistent across the cluster by way of replication as sort of a side effect of replication. This is kind of cool because it was totally lazy and easy to build, but it is far from a perfect index and it's something that we definitely want to improve. Uh, to query an index, it's simply an index name and the, the secondary key that you're interested in, and you can call that from any prepare method or any apply method. Uh, but of course, because of the eventual consistency and because it's optimistic with respect to the entity, there's false positives and false negatives possible. So it's, it's not awesome, but it does give us what we're after in most cases. So now let's talk about the storage engine itself, um, which could be a really, really complex thing. We could, we could really rat hole on that. Um, instead, we, we built a lot of interface uh, and, and have tried a lot of things out. So there are two concepts that are sort of layered, objects and blobs, and there are two interfaces in Go, object store and blob store. And each of these interfaces implement the load, store, load exclusive, and store exclusive methods. And you can imagine what the difference is, right? The the expectation is that there's some lock held between a load exclusive and the matching store exclusive. And we'll get to the implementation of that in a moment. These are intended to be layered so that we can, we can ex experiment, pull things out, put, th put things in, and change the implementations underneath. Um, and so at the top layer, our object store is, is, a B, is called BSON object store. All it does is serialize some Go object into BSON and give it to a blob store. Calls the same method and that's that. And on the other way out, it reads from a blob store, it loads the object and then it deserializes it and, and returns it. And it uses the, the type of the object as a prefix to the key so that everything gets organized by the, the type of the object, which is a nice property for debugging and introspecting. <clears throat> So then below that, that object store, we have a blob store, and it's a file blob store, and it's, it's stupid simple. It stores things on the file system, and we make our guarantees about atomicity by the rename system call. We make our guarantees about serializability with the flock system, and, uh, and then at this layer, we include an, an, an epoch number in the file names that we use so that we can increment that and have a consistent place 
for backup purposes. So I talked about how this is layerable and we can do a lot with it. We've experimented with adding uh, an LZO blob store in between to do compression, which would be a matter of putting it in and taking it out because it would just be a blob store that funnels things down to another blob store. We also put at the very top level an indexing object store, which is what reads those index tags out and builds the index and it uses uh, an object index, another interface, and an object store to to structure this and when you call the store methods it calls index to put stuff on disk and it's using the implementation is again a, a file system based index called dir object index that builds out these indexes so, and and then the queries are pretty straightforward as well they're they're listing files so on disk all these entities all these transitions are laid out like this it's a essentially length prefixed bson and the interesting thing, uh, and I have a copy paste error on this, that should say BSON, um, is that the name of the type is outside of the, the actual BSON payload. This is a, a side effect of using a statically typed language to build this. In order to deserialize something into a Go object, you have to know the type of thing to allocate to put it in. So we need that type name before we go and deserialize so that we can create something to put it into. So that's why the protocol is the way that it is. And we've, we've built it out this way because it, it's the, the least, in this part of the system at least, the uh, simplest possible solution gives us the most flexibility into the future. And we chose to do it with BSON instead of what probably the most common alternative I think is probably protocol buffers, simply because there are nice things about BSON and Go in how it mirrors the standard library and there are only a couple of things that people tend to really love about protocol buffers and then one thing that they really hate. And at least most people I think hate the generated code and, and that workflow. The two things that are cool about protocol buffers are the way that they help you do uh, sort of, I guess you'd call it compression, it's a sort of manual compression by using indexes instead of names for the fields. But you can do that yourself with BSON by using short keys. And the other thing that people really tend to like is the way that it helps you evolve your schema and version your data. And again, I'd say that you can do that with BSON. When you have, say you have a, a field and you want to change its type, what you can do is create a new field with a new, with the same name and, and use the new type in your Go structure, but have a different BSON key so that you're not squashing the old stuff. And you can evolve the schema in the same way. You have to be just as careful and you can be just as, as flexible as you can with a protocol buffer. And it just feels nicer. So that's my pitch for BSON. On the wire, it, uh, it looks exactly like it does on disk, more or less. And uh, this was because of a misguided attempt to put the, the timers and the sort of uh, server sent event stuff down into the data store originally. We abandoned that so now it's kind of uh, a, a little bit of a burden on us, but I'll cover that in a moment. Um, then, and I guess I've spoiled that we chose Go, but I swear we didn't just choose Go and that was the end of it. We talked about other tools that are out there, other languages that are out there. And despite having some Java code in production, everyone also had sort of Java shell shock and didn't want to go down that road again. So we looked at Scala. Seems like a thing people are productive in. And I feel at least that it's, it's C++. It has so much syntax, so much stuff shoehorned into the same runtime that we would have to make our own little Scala. And then we'd still just basically be writing like less verbose Java. So what about C? It's not the Java, it's not JVM, it's not all that stuff. Um, it's cool, but it's, as we all probably know, tedious to write a big system in C. It's error prone. Um, it's a nice hammer to have though, so that, that'd be nice to be able to drop down to it if we need to. So then we came to Go, and at that point, um, and this was approaching a year ago when we were starting to consider this stuff, um, everything but the garbage collector really was awesome and the garbage collector is getting better and more importantly you have such control over whether you create garbage in Go that we don't find that the immaturity relative to, to 
hotspot and all of that in Java is uh, is actually that much of an impediment. We don't see stop the world GC pauses that cause requests to time out or any of the scary things that you might expect. So I still vote heavily in favor of Go for this sort of work. Um, and so a couple of things about it. First, if you're not familiar and you're curious, always Google for Golang or you're going to have a bad time. So the language is about four years old, approaching, I guess, four years old. And uh, it's a constant exercise in Ken Thompson, Rob Pike, Russ Cox, and Robert Greismer being smarter than us. And that's cool. It makes it a joy to use. But so Ken Thompson is like a, a or the Unix guy. Rob Pike and Russ Cox worked on Plan 9 at Bell Labs. Robert Greismer worked on Hotspot and V8. These guys know how to build stuff. And uh, personally, to me, I love the fact that it's statically typed. Uh, the, the way that it is object-oriented is different, so you need to take the time to learn how embedding is different than inheriting and how you can use that to your advantage, uh, it, especially with respect to how interfaces work and go. Um, and then there's this uh, notion of communicating sequential processes being a part of the language. This is uh, some communication primitives from long ago that um, that have really made programming in Go compared to an event-based system a total joy. Um, so a quick show of hands, I have sort of a choose your own adventure here. Do people want me to go a little deeper on Go and what's cool about it? That's not nearly enough. I'm, uh, come talk later if you're really curious, I'd love to talk about it, but we'll skip that for now. So a few selected war stories about building this system. So number one, since we set out with a particular customer thing that we needed to build in mind, we were not building a data store to use later. We were building a data store to use yesterday. And that was rough um, for a number of reasons. One was that for expedience, the, the transitions and the entities, all this stuff is declared in a subdirectory of the, of the data store's source code. And that means that the service that's using it, the, the first case being roulette, is split across two Git repositories and being implemented by engineers that are not so accustomed to building with stored procedures. And because it was so early days for the data store itself, I actually couldn't give a whole lot of guidance on how to use it effectively because it was like 5% done. So there was a lot of fits and starts when we were getting going with this that I think the co-implementation of two or more com complicated things at the same time sort of inevitably causes. It's something to be aware of when you're planning if you plan to do something like this. Um, and we sort of made it worse by having uh, a lots of chiefs scenario going on where there was some top-down design going on, there was some bottom-up design going on. And from my perspective, I cared a lot about preserving the artistic freedom of the other guys, so there was not the dictatorial vision that was necessary for, for getting this stuff built the right way the first time in a consistent manner all the way through. And so that for that, really, um, I think there needs to be a sort of benevolent dictator for a sufficiently large project. Then there's this notion of the non-HTTP interface. And I touched on that a little bit before. You saw the protocol. It's not complicated, but it's certainly not HTTP. And I think the bad thing about this is not that it made any technical implementation difficulties, but that it changed the attitude of how people use the system. Because it's not an HTTP interface, I feel like people were using a data store. If it were an HTTP interface, this is a, a hypothesis that needs to be tested, I feel like it would be much more like using an application platform whose interesting property is that it's incredibly close to its data. And that's a different mindset. And that, I think, is a more productive mindset that I'd like to bring to this system in the future. So the next thing, I guess, I have to say some words about testing, because testing distributed systems is terrible in most every system I've ever seen. So it's easy, right, as a unit to test that data is written to a log, or that a log is read successfully, or that a network listener deserializes bytes properly, or, or any number of those things. It's easy to test those units, but it's usually 
a leap of faith that your units are going to mesh together well. So to solve this problem in a satisfactory way, um, we just start three processes in the same Go process and communicate with them. And the fact that you can do that with the, the communicating sequential processes primitives of just being able to say, go serve 9999, go serve 9998, go serve 9997, and have three running processes that you can communicate and observe and you know, sleep and watch that replication actually happened is really, really powerful for testing. It also means that you can fire up those listeners and then do nasty stuff to their file descriptors to test error conditions like what happens when you get TCP resets. Uh, I highly recommend that you do it even though the code is totally ugly because nothing gives you confidence that you're going to handle failures well than actually handling failures well. So now for a, a cool uh, and embarrassing bug. So I maintain a port in Go of Coda Hale's really sweet Java metrics library, and uh, we use it heavily in this data store. It's, uh, it's how we get in information, not only on how long things take, but also things like how far in, uh, where we are in the replication log is exported as a metric, so that we can just graph replication lag in a very visible way. Um, only there was a bug where we would observe timeouts, and we could like sit at a terminal and watch them happen, but we couldn't see anything show up in the metrics, so we had no visibility into where in the system these were happening. And the, the reason, so we discovered it by accidentally commenting the metrics code while we were messing around trying to find the actual issue. It turned out to be the issue. There's a busy lock in the metrics code, and I didn't realize how busy, and that's my bad, that's the embarrassing part. Um, so what we had happening was we had a call that was updating a, a timer that was the time that it took to, to do some call. And the time itself was, was already resolved. So the, the transition had applied in some you know, microseconds, but then it sat waiting to tell the metrics code that it took some number of microseconds forever. And so nothing showed up in metrics as being taking a long time, but we could sit and observe these timeouts. So um, that bug is fixed, and I believe, once again, you can trust the Go metrics code should you be using it. Um, so egg on my face there. Another one, how did that get cut off? Oh, well, um, was in the business of replication. So we have some competing things here, and we have some features that we wanted to be orthogonal that at a time were not. So recall that there are prepare steps and then apply steps to transitions. And we used to allow, there used to not be a prepare step, and we used to allow you to dispatch other transitions during apply. That meant that that, that dispatch would have to be dealt with in replication. And we made the decision to keep from double applying things, to skip replicating it the first time, and then let the, let the dispatch happen again. And that resulted in some very subtle and non-obvious non-determinism in our replication. It took a long time to notice, but we finally did, and had to make the choice whether we go down the, the more formal nested, uh, nested transactions research style solution, which th that's a hugely long dissertation, probably don't go read it. Um, the basic idea is that there's a ton of undo state that you necessarily have to keep around if you're going to do a, a, a nested transaction over this sort of stuff. The other direction we could go was to create this prepare step to punt away the part where there's this double apply possibility. And so that's what we did because it really dramatically simplified the potential solution. And then the last thing that we goofed badly, and I think this happens all too often, so I put it last, is that we just didn't spend enough time building the administrative and introspective tools for this system. We have Go metrics, we have everything instrumented to a ridiculous degree, and we have a couple of tools like we can apply any arbitrary transition from the command line, and that's cool. But to look at entities on disk, we're using HD, and to look at stuff at a higher level as how they fit into the application, we're sort of dumping stuff into Cassandra and looking at log entries, and it's, it's not effective. So, and this, I say this all the time and yet can't quite get it to happen, is it really, 
I think we need to be budgeting half our time to build admin tools to make our own lives easier. Because when, when we're in a fire and we have to hex dump a file, we're just, I mean, it's just going to take longer to fix the problem. So you're never going to actually spend half your time on admin tools. But if you at least try to, you're going to spend a non-zero amount of time. And I think that's actually the important thing. So the million dollar question is, would we do it again? And because of the, the degree to which we found new and unexpected use cases for this stuff, even during this, this first six months that it's been in production, I think it's a resounding yes. It's, it's a data model and a, and a programming model that's really suiting the types of systems that we're building. And we found, at least at our scale, that building such a system was a pretty tractable effort. So in the future, we're definitely going to be working on the high availability of our coordinators. That's something that we designed and consciously didn't build for timing reasons. We're going to be making secondary indexes not embarrassing. I think we're going to bring back uh, a notion of an HTTP interface because I think that's really going to change the attitude for an even better programming model. And we're gearing up to open source the Go HTTP stuff that we've been using uh, for other services internally. So watch this space for that as well. Um, and of course, uh, I'm here because I think it's awesome to work at Bettable, and I think it would be awesome for you to work at Bettable. Get out of my space, Wi-Fi. So hit me up if uh, any of this stuff sound in sounds interesting, the math, the money, the data. And that's it. Thanks. There's five minutes if anyone has questions or snide remarks before lightning talks. Yes, sir. Yes, to a degree. Um, in fact, I think that's the most likely candidate for the Gen 2 version of that. Um, the reason that we didn't do level DB from the beginning uh, is mostly that, um, that the bit about the, the, the log structured merge in level DB is it wouldn't be useful to us for our actual log because what we're after is replicating the transitions, not the, the entities themselves. So there'd kind of be like a lot of little level DBs around. And I think that could still be very useful, um, but it didn't get us anything except disk storage at first. So we did the simple thing. Yes, sir. Uh, since the transitions you're doing uh, in the system are effectively uh, free from code that can do anything, um, did you find you need to do anything in particular for providing isolation uh, sort of between different services? Um, is this like all being developed in-house by trusted engineers or are you actually allowing uh, third-party people to develop that? It's a, so I'll come back to the mic. Um, it is in use, it's something that we develop, so the, the, the people implementing transitions are other bettable engineers. Um, so that answers one part of the question. Um, the other about providing isolation, um, in the ACID sense, isolation is provided by the APIs available to you in a transition. Isolation in the crash the process sense is provided by the, uh, the notion of panic and recover in Go. So there's the, um, the function that applies the transition is called apply uh, in, the, in the service code. And then there's a wrapper function around that called apply calmly that figures out whether it panicked and responds with an appropriate, uh, you know, dear developer, you done goofed kind of error to help people get out of panicking during their transitions. Yes. The question was how long did it take and how many people are involved. Um, we prototyped a lot of this stuff towards the end of 2012. We started building in earnest in January and launched it to developers in February or March and to public use shortly after that. Um, I'm the primary developer and one, two, three other guys have done significant work on it. Um, 
and then two additional people have written 99% of the transitions that are in use. Any others? Any others? Anyone ready to go to the bar? Cool. Thanks, guys.